we're going to set, start the session. Good evening, everybody. Thank you all for registering. At, all right. Okay. Thank you all for registering and attending the seven day online faculty development program on outcome based education, OBE. Uh, this is being organized by the, uh, the Internal Quality Assurance Cell IQAC of ACS College. Uh, which is in the, done in association with the Kerala State Higher Education Council, KSHEC. Uh, we would like to welcome Dr. Rajan Kulukal, Vice Chairman, KSHEC, Dr. Rajan Vargis, Member Secretary, KSHEC, Dr. Saji Gobernath, Vice Chancellor, uh, Digital University, Kerala, Dr. Priya Nair, Research Officer, KSHEC, uh, Sri Vinil Vargis, Manager, SES College, Dr. Dominic Thomas, Principal, SES College, Dr. Sajis PJ, IQSC Coordinator, SES College, Dr. Tanya, uh, AC Assistant Professor and HOD, Department of Physics, SES College, and all the FTP resource persons, managers, directors, principals, vice principals, representatives from management, HODs, IQSC coordinators, and all faculty members. A very warm welcome to you all. Uh, about this FTP. Uh, this is a seven day program with live sessions from timing from 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. We do expect all of you to attend on all these seven days. All the participants who are paid the processing fee will receive the LMS access, the video recording for all the days, and also a participation certificate. If any of you are yet to make the payment, please make the payment of amount of uh, 300 to SES College to the account details in the chat. I will sh shortly share that in the chat. LMS hands-on activities have to be completed along with the FTP. Uh, my name is Sujin Jacob George. I'm the Global Relations Manager with IPSR Solutions Limited, and I will be the event moderator for this session. Uh, now, to give you an introduction of KSHEC, the Kerala State Higher Education Council, KSHEC, is the principal higher education policy input provider and trend center of the state of Kerala, and it's and it strives to bring out bring about equity and excellence in the higher education sector. The council is an apex level statutory body instituted under the Kerala State Higher Education Council Act 2007 and the Kerala State Higher Education Council Amendment Act of 2018 of the state legislature of Kerala. Perceiving its democratic stature as a participatory approach in making decisions, the council is often uh, denominated as a mandated working collective of all the stakeholders of of the higher education sector, including academics, administrators, and students. Now, about SES College Karnur, SES College Srikantabaram is a temple of learning for rural communities situated atop a picturesque hill, uh, where the celebrates environment gives an ideal ambience for pursuits in higher education. The college was established in 1981 with the mission of empowering rural cooperation through education. This college has got accredited with a big trade in by NAC, NAAC, uh, the institution has always opened its doors to all sections of people irrespective of caste, creed, and community, and works tirelessly to build a community of staff and students committed to the pursuit of moral, intellectual, and academic excellence. Now, before we move on to the welcome address, if it is possible for you all to turn on your videos, we would like to take a small screenshot of your for uh, documentation purposes. So if you could all turn on your videos for a short period. We'll just take a uh, screenshot for documentation purpose. All right, uh, let them take the screenshots. I will continue. Okay, the first session will be on, uh, will be the welcome address. Uh, we'll have the welcome address by Dr. Dominic Thomas, principal of SES College. 
Uh, Dr. Dominic Thomas has got a teaching experience of 31 years. He's a seven member of Kainur University, Joint Secretary, Kerala State Principals Council Secretary, Principals Council, Kainur University. He's a research, research supervisor for Kainur University, Kerala, Sri Vekateshwara University, Amroha, UP. He has also been the paper setter, examiner, uh, member board of, uh, of studies of various uh, universities. He has presented papers in national and international seminars and conferences, has also published many articles in national and international journals. Over to you, sir, for the welcome address, Dr. Dominic Thomas. Thank you, sir. The whole higher education scenario is rewarding and rejuvenating itself based on the parameters of NEP and OBE. It is one of the most, one of these parameters to assess the progress of the institution. UGC and NAC are also trying hard to ensure that the desired outcomes from the basis of the entire learning system. An outcome-based curriculum is designed with the outcomes in mind right in its conception. The course content and the assessments are developed based on the outcome itself. Hence, we organize this national level online FDP on outcome based education in association with the Kerala State Higher Education Council from 18th January to 25th, 25th January 2023, so that all the academicians and academic administrators get the knowledge on how to implement OBE. SES College feels really proud to host this national level online FDP on OBE in association with KSHIC. I take it as an honor to welcome the dignitaries today. Today we have Dr. Rajan Gurikal, the Vice Chairman of KSHIC, to inaugurate the session, who is one of the most suitable persons who can comment upon the recent progress in higher education sector. Welcome you, sir, to the session. We are privileged to have the dignified presence of Dr. Rajan Vogis, the member secretary of KSHEC, who would preside over today's session. Hearty welcome to you, sir. Dr. Sajidana Govinar, the Honorable Vice Chancellor of Digital University, has made this session more meaningful through his distinguished presence today. He would deliver the keynote address in today's session. On behalf of SES College and KSHEC, I extend a warm welcome to you, sir. We could not have made this happen today without the motivation, mentorship, and the cooperation of Dr. Mendes Job, Professor and Director of MCA Department, Marian College, Kutiganam. I take this opportunity to extend my personal gratitude and a hearty welcome to you, sir. All the initiatives of ACS College happened through the hard work and smart effort of our IQAC coordinator, Dr. Sajish TJ, and Dr. AC Danya, IQAC member. This session would definitely guide the IQAC on how to implement OB. Welcome users to the inaugural sessions. I am sure that today's session is going to be most fruitful through the presence of these dignified people who are contributing rigorously to the higher education scenario for the past several years. I also welcome Dr. Sunil Job, Dr. Suresh Nambodri, Dr. Jobi Suri, and Dr. Binu, Binu Thomas who will speak to you in the coming days. On behalf of SES College, I welcome you all wholeheartedly to the session. We have received more than 1,000 registration, and this shows the contemporary relevance of OBE. And I am sure that all the participants are going to reap the best out of this national level online FTP. I extend a very warm welcome to you all. Once again, thank you all. Welcome you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, Dr. Dominic Thomas. We will next move on to the inaugural address by Dr. Rajan Gurukal, who is the Vice Chairman for KSHEC. Dr. Rajan Gurukal is the former Vice Chancellor of Madhuma Gandhi University, Kodem. Dr. Rajan Gurukal is a leading uh, Indian social scientist, historian, professor, and writer. He has written many books and articles on different topics and also received awards for his works. Over to you, sir. Okay. Good evening, all of you. Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor Saji Gopinath, respected uh, Member Secretary KSGC, uh, Dr. Rajan Varghese, uh, Dr. Dominic Thomas, Principal 
ACS College. Dr. Mendes, who is the lead behind the program. My dear colleagues, uh, by way of inauguration, I just have to say only how important outcome-based education is. But importance is easier said than executed. Outcome-based education is not at all easy because at each facet, it requires dedication from the part of the course designers. Writing learning outcome is not an easy job. First one has to be thorough with the taxonomy. And then each constituent of the taxonomy has to be understood thoroughly in such a way that it can be carried forward with the thought process, the thought process in mind, thought process behind the identification of each cognitive phase or each cognitive stage. And then the challenge is how to include that as part of the content management and then how to translate into teaching uh, process. So all these can be acquired only over a period of time and at each phase it varies from teacher to teacher. Some of the teachers will be able to do it excellently well as we all do things in our respective fields but always there is unevenness about it. But one way or other, we have to uh, strive hard and see that we are able to professionally do justice to the preparation of the course, writing, learning outcomes, and incorporating that as part of the content and then practicing it with an ever renewing kind of creative intervention without which it will become mechanical. When we were told that there should be objective stated before every paper in the past, as a ritual, it used to be written. Some objectives would be there and then after writing the objectives, they would be forgotten. And when content is written, nothing regarding the objectives would be reflected over there because the contents are managed through cut and paste, taking some from the previous and some from some other papers. You know, it was all done in a very shoddy way. Now, it is now becoming increasingly challenging because we are giving uh, unprecedented precedence of learning over teaching. It has to be considered as outcome-based learning having primacy and teachers have to see that outcome-based learning is... I didn't catch that. Could you try again? Outcome-based learning is uh, facilitated so as to uh, encourage students to learn effectively. Learn in alignment with the learning outcomes identified. So it's a continuous process of graduating from one cognitive benefit to the other. And also, it's a process of continuous evaluation 
by both continuous concurrent analysis of one's own achievement by the students and concurrent assessment of teaching by the teacher and then jointly through a variety of exercises assessment of the students there would be participation by students themselves in assessment so it's really uh, a thrilling uh, activity teachers who are rather bored up with their practice would feel that teaching is becoming not only intellectually challenging but becoming very interesting for each teacher maybe in the coming five years or so we will have a good number of maverick teachers very original and creative teachers in the field thanks to technology their teaching modules would get recorded and would become objects for others to emulate anyway it's a it's a field in its infancy at the moment there is lot of distance to be covered and it's going to be an, an ever augmenting field of teaching learning now with these words i declare the very enterprising session inaugurated Sir, uh, next we will have the presidential address uh, by Dr. Rajan Varghi, the Honorable Member Secretary of uh, Kerala State Higher Education Council. He is the former Pro Vice Chancellor of MG University. Uh, sir, welcome to this session. Okay, okay. Good evening to all. Uh, Honorable Vice Chairman of the Kerala State Higher Education Council, Professor Rajan Gurukul, sir, uh, Dr. Sajid Gomida, Honorable. Vice Chancellor of uh, Digital University of Kerala, Principal of SES College, Dr. Dominic Thomas, and uh, Dr. Mendes Jacob, the person behind this outcome uh, training program. Uh, this is, in fact, a truly a national uh, seminar. In fact, by, by the sheer number, and the spread of different participants, you can see that this has become an important uh, national event or seminar that is being organized in this part of the country. As noted by uh, Professor Gurikal Sar, Council has been in the forefront of training our teachers especially in the post-COVID period, we try to train our teachers, especially in the online mode with regard to Moodle LMS. What is required today is changes in the method of teaching, learning, because we are confronted with very important challenges. For example, at the national level, there is a drastic change as far as educational policies are concerned. And some of our colleges are finding it difficult to get sufficient number of students. And the state of Kerala, like other parts of India, they are facing what is called the large scale migration of students within the country to the outside world. So the world has undergone tremendous transformation thanks to the revolutionary changes in technology 
and the development of new programs and institutions elsewhere. So the knowledge of good institution, either accredited or ranked, it is in the domain of even to the ordinary student. They are selecting institutions. They are going for institutions and countries where employment opportunities are maximized. So this also creates a lot of problem within the state, within the country. One important aspect that we have to consider at this point of time is to improve the quality of our teaching learning. Then only we can sustain and continue our higher education system. This is going to be a big challenge. And outcome-based education, training for teachers in outcome-based education will definitely going to impact the future pace of development in higher education. Sometimes it is going to determine the fate of several programs and institutions. So what is required today is teachers who are not only qualified, but also teachers who have got the skill and also the will to impart knowledge in line with the development in the different knowledge domain. So this will make our institutions more relevant in the present context. So council started this exercise in 2017. We have already trained nearly 3,500 teachers from different colleges and universities in the state. So this national level program will definitely impact the quality of our teachers. It will improve their capacity to deliver meaningful say, higher education to the students. This will also enhance the quality of our higher education institutions in general. And the council solicit the cooperation of the entire academic community in the state to improve the quality of higher education in the state. And we are also prepared to extend all help to our teachers and institutions. With these words, I conclude, I thank, especially the organizers of this program, the CS College and also uh, the team headed by Dr. Mendes for organizing this wonderful program. With these words, I conclude. I thank all the people. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you for those wonderful words. Thank you, Dr. Raja Yes. We will now uh, move on to the keynote address that will be delivered by Dr. Sajid Gobnath, who is the Vice Chancellor for Digital University Kerala. Dr. Sajid Gobnath is the uh, first Vice Chancellor of the newly formed Kerala University of Kerala, University of Digital Sciences, Innovation and Technology, Digital University Kerala. Before, before assuming this position in 2000, he served as a CEO of Kerala Startup Mission for three years and also worked as Director of Indian Institute of Information Technology and Management, Kerala. Dr. Gobinath was associated with the Indian Institute of Management for over 17 years as its Dean Academics, Dean Development, and Professor in Operations Management. He was also the Director of TAPMI Manipal and the founding Dean of Bennett University set up by Times of India. He also serves as visiting faculty for a few universities in Europe and Australasia. Over to you, sir. Uh, Professor Saji Gobinath, both Rajan Varghese and myself have another meeting. So kindly excuse us for sure, you know, it starts exactly okay. at 7 30. Okay. Thank you for your presentation. Okay. Good okay. evening, uh, uh, respected uh, uh, Vice Chairman of Kerala State Higher Education Council, uh, Dr. Rajan Mergi, sir. Sorry, Dr. Rajan Gurukar, sir. Uh, Member Secretary, Dr. Rajan Mergi. Uh, Dr. Dominic Thomas, Principal, SES College, my good friend and uh, coordinator of this program, uh, Dr. Mendes Jacob, 
other uh, participants from different part of the country. In fact, uh, uh, I should congratulate uh, Dr. Mendes because uh, even in the evening hours, uh, such a very large uh, number of people are actually joining this program. Uh, and uh, uh, it also shows that uh, this topic uh, of OBE is still very relevant. Uh, like uh, uh, Professor Rajan uh, Gurukal has mentioned, uh, uh, implementing an OBE is a very, very long process. As some of you are aware that uh, uh, OBE is now, I believe, maybe around uh, 30 years uh, uh, old. I believe that uh, even in uh, late 1980s, uh, the Washington Accord, uh, where uh, the OBE in engineering curriculum uh, was introduced, uh, uh, has happened sometime in 1989. And uh, now, after 33 years or 34 years, we still are not uh, fully clear uh, of uh, how uh, OBE can actually be implemented and whether we are really getting the benefit of it. Even in Indian context, uh, I think uh, Indian government adopted Washington Accord sometime in uh, mid-2000s, uh, 2010 or 12 or something. So even we have an experience of more than 10, 12 years in OBE, but even then uh, it uh, is getting implemented many times uh, in a manner which like uh, Professor Rajan Gurukul has rightly mentioned, more at a at a uh, what we call as a template level where you start ticking the boxes rather than looking at the real philosophy behind that i think that is the context which i thought i will uh, uh, briefly uh, discuss with you uh, because we have uh, a long uh, very long a week long uh, program where a lot of experts of ob will uh, take all of you or all of us uh, to the nuances of it, how do we actually get it done? How do really we ensure that the outcomes are defined in alignment with the vision of the institution and how program uh, objectives are, can actually be formulated, how assurance of learning can actually be uh, measured. The whole process, uh, which includes uh, the educational theory to the analytics part of it will be covered uh, in this program. That's what uh, uh, Dr. Mendes uh, also mentioned to me when we were discussing about this program. So I thought I will not uh, go into the mechanics of uh, OBE. Uh, and I'm sure that many of you sitting here have got experience in doing that. And uh, be it a part of an NBA accreditation or part of an NAC accreditation or some of the other regional accreditations, uh, most of our institutions programs must have gone through. Uh, is audio not clear? It is clear. Uh, it's clear. Okay. You're audible. You're audible. Uh, so uh, uh, UBF uh, must have some experiences of going through that. But why are we having such a great interest at this point of time? And maybe uh, I would like to look at from a very, very uh, 30,000 view approach and uh, see how this becomes very relevant and uh, more of more or less it becomes mandatory for us to imbibe that in the whole spirit uh, because when when ob is implemented as a tool or a technique it becomes something which uh, professor rajan gurukal mentioned that you you fix the objectives uh, you you wanted to have uh, uh, right uh, uh, the core learning level has to be there so you basically put such words in your assessment methodologies etc without really applying in mind that you no know, whether it is really half uh, 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 whether it is really understood or not so it's extremely important for us uh, when we are getting into a long program to go into the depth of ob to to imbibe the spirit of this whole concept of outcome based uh, education uh, in that context is what i thought i would uh, share some of my perspectives and uh, Preferably, we will have uh, 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 we will have uh, discussions uh, uh, depending upon the availability of time. Maybe I will speak for around twenty minutes, and I will uh, uh, have remaining time. We will have discussions. So 
let me share my screen and uh, i thought that i will uh, put this in a context of uh, what is happening in the world of education uh, the world of education in general and very world of education particularly in india is actually going through a very very uh, interesting phase of disruption uh, uh, in fact uh, uh, like uh, uh, rajin gulkar sir has mentioned uh, if implemented in a in a proper manner uh, it's a very exciting and a very enjoyable experience for uh, teachers uh, because uh, you are actually moving from a role where uh, we, we we sit at one stage and provide the information or knowledge to a place where we co create the knowledge we actually work along the side of a student into a learning process and that becomes a very very exciting thing uh, fortunately for me i had experience uh, uh, at i am where we used to speak about to the students many times that the the primary uh, requirement of a student is to ensure that the teacher leaves the classroom at least with five unanswered questions and most of my students do that very due diligently so it always become an, a very exciting ex experience for you to go back and then you need to ensure that your your preparations are far better and then you come in, in into a process where the learning happens uh, into the classroom person so we are moving from a world where teaching is actually transitioning to to the learning which used to be we used to say for years like we always used to say that's a learning centered uh, uh, education system etc but it, when it comes to reality the way we assess our students the way we assess our education programs to a large extent is still being a, a, a teacher centered model but that is now undergoing a world of disruption that's the context in which i think we should look at uh, uh ob uh, into a large in, into this context so if, if if any of you have any um, uh, comments please to uh, please to raise uh, um, um, uh, on the chat box we can take it up so when you speak about the disruption i'm looking at uh, the global as well as uh, national challenges uh, not only because of covid but in general there is a, a, a tendency or a trend happening Uh, primarily because of technology uh, suddenly you see that the information uh, dissemination which happens in a classroom situation is actually becoming easily available and accessible to a large number of people much much easier than that so it's, it's so a student can actually listen to an on way lecture for, from a teacher far better in the comfort of their homes from a from a, a, a youtube video uh, if if there are no interactivities if there is no cross cultural discussions if there is no student learning uh, uh, effort then it becomes whether he sits in a classroom or whether he sits in front of a a, a computer uh, listening to some placid lectures it's going to be the same and in fact many times the the youtube lectures provide you far better visuals and far better interactivity uh, and immersion than a classroom per se so this is basically the big trend uh, happening and uh, uh, if if some of us who i mean I'm, i'm sure that there are many of our classes are not like that which are much more uh, student centric and learning oriented but and others may feel others uh, can i mean you can actually ask a simple question that if i am not putting the attendance in the class if i am making the students voluntary to attend the class how many of the students will turn up in my class if the answer is 100% if the answer is 80% then your class is fantastic there is a real learning happening in the class but if if the answer is that well if i remove the attendance a very large number of students may not come for that then then there is a there is an issue of uh, learning which which is happening so that's a very simple uh, 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 that's a very simple what i say as a litmus test on whether your classes are Uh, is actually learning centric or not more than any other things this is a very simple litmus test but more importantly uh, we are actually undergoing a time where a substantive change is happening in the national uh, education policies and uh, i was used to say that uh, you know uh, some of us who work in the area of management and who follow who who looks at business and business education uh, we 
we can actually make a very clear parallel between what has happening in 1990s. I'm sure that many of the young teachers here may not have maybe a students or even uh, uh, much, much smaller at that point of time. But you can ask people who had their uh, career at that point of time and ask them what happened between 1990 and today in the industry or a business field. In 1990s, it's a time when India actually undertaken a huge amount of reforms in the business space. A lot of regulations got changed. A lot of uh, things got streamlined. It took some time, it took a few years, but uh, it made a big change. Now, the impact of that is that there are many organizations who are thriving or who are doing extremely well in court, uncaught at that point of time because of the regime, suddenly actually vanished. So if you look at uh, 100 institutions who were there at 1990s, maybe 20 of them are not there. They just, just vanished. But at the same time, there are few of them who really excel. They really become big. They really become uh, world-class. They become uh, globally competitive. Now, why I'm speaking about this 1990 is that to a some extent that 1990 is coming back in the education space today. With NEP, I'm not, we are not going to discuss about the NEP's uh, positives or negatives or challenges of it at this point. But the fact is that NEP is actually bringing a paradigmic change. That paradigmic shift is very akin to what happened in the context of business and uh, industry in 1990s. So unless we really gear up and to ensure that the, our institutions become relevant, individuals become relevant, the, the plight of those companies and those industry, in, in, industries which had vanished during that period of time, believe me, this includes even public sector organizations, not, not that the government organizations were immune. There are many government organizations, name a few, HMT, uh, any other public organizations who are doing extremely well at that point of time, just uh, could not sustain uh, uh, when this paradigmic shift happens. Now, this, this shift is actually happening in the education space, and we don't have too much of time to adjust to that. We may have to actually make that change very, very fast. Now, some of you may be thinking that in, a, in, a, in an FDP or an OBE, where which is more of a process, uh, uh, which looks at uh, the outcome-based education, where you need to actually look at how do we create the outcomes, how do you measure the outcome, how do you uh, en ensure that the entire loop is complete? Why are we speaking about uh, some paradigmic shift which is happening into the, into the, into the national space? The reason being, if you, if you understand outcome-based education in, in total, which is nothing but what you claim your vision of your institution, what you claim your students is going to achieve uh, in the learning process. That's primarily what the outcome-based education is, in essence, is actually giving you. And that is something which we need to align with what's happening into the, into the national uh, scenario per se. So it's important for us to keep that in mind. And at the same time, we also see that because of this is at one side we have this challenge. The other side, because of a substantive amount of uh, uh, developments happening in various sectors, it is also said that future is going to be the this century is going to be the century of the country. The uh, the Amrit Kal, which our honourable Prime Minister has brought us for the next 25 years, is a time where the knowledge economy is going to boom in this country, and we as people who create that knowledge economy, who, who create, uh, who catalyze the knowledge economy through our institutions are the ones who are going to lead that. Just like in 1950s and 60s, uh, the industrial workers and the industrial uh, um, uh, leaders actually built the country. It is this role of knowledge leaders and knowledge workers to build the country, uh, uh, to make it globally the most prominent one in the next 25 years. So one end, you have a paradigmic shift. At the other end, you have a huge amount of opportunity. It is in this context we need to actually look at uh, uh, the changes which is happening as well as the change of role of the academic and the change of role and the new processes have to be looked at from uh, that particular angle. And briefly looking at the global change, we know that uh, there, is a, a, there is a substantive change which is happening in the way the 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 ecosystems are changing in the world uh, from a world where everything was centralized, uh, uh, which was what the model which was followed till recently, we are actually moving to a world where 
quite a bit of a decentralization happening. Now, when you have, a, when you speak about a decentralization, it's as good as a student who pass out of our institution rather than going to a business enterprise or an, an industry or a college to uh, do his or her work may sit from home and start doing that, which means the person should have the ability to learn themselves, to manage themselves, and to create uh, products and services themselves. I, I'm sure that many of your colleges where you, you, you are part of it, many of your students are already doing that. And over the years, this is going to be a big change. The conventional way of the, the employment vocations are actually going to make a shift when we go back to a world where things are actually going to become decentralized. Because if you look at 200 years back, everything was happening in small villages. Excess used to get shipped from one place to another place. The last century, or maybe previous to that, because of the industrial revolutions, things become centralized. So you have large factories, large format, mass production sort of a model. Even education become a mass format as such. From that mass format, we are now moving to into small formats, the individualized uh, solutions, the decentralized workspaces. So in this sort of a move uh, is one big trend which is happening. Along with that, we also see there is a quite a bit of uh, technological advancement which is happening around us and uh, uh, <clears throat> which, which is uh, which obviously technology always drive change in in the in the in the economy and it was various technologies at a different point of time it was textile technology which the steam engines and uh, the electricity which drove the first industrial revolution while the automobile technology was the one which was the prime mover for the second industrial revolution and the computers and electronics which drove the, the third industrial revolution it is the ai data uh, uh, analytics, these are the ones which is driving the today's world per se. Now, while this this is something which drives the economy, it has got its own ramifications into the education space. Just to give you an example, if you look at the world before this revolution, the schools or the classrooms were more of a guru gulas, right? Where a guru have got 10 disciples and the, the learning was happening in that confined space. Guru knows everybody's learning orientation and the learner approach was happening. When we move to a mass education, mass uh, production philosophies, the education also moved from the gurukulas to larger colleges, larger schools, larger institutions. The advantage, it become easily accessible. Large number of people got access to education compared to very limited number which was in the past. Now, when we are again moving to small, you are going to have the best of both worlds. You still move into a world where people get individualized attention. At the same time, you will be able to provide them at scale. So this shift is the second shift which is happening. The third shift which is happening is on the culture. Whether we like it or not, there is quite a bit of free resources, community-based education, and an access economy which is happening around us. And today you can actually do almost free of cost a course from world's number one university because it may be available in one of the free platforms. Uh, you may not be able to get a certification, but you can always get the learning. You don't have to actually pay for that. You can actually interact with the peers in any part of the world. So you are suddenly seeing that the competition for uh, uh, the, the, the people are actually being looked at from multiple places into uh, into into a sp same space as such. Now this this spread across the places. Now, some people used to say that, well, this is only available for urban people and not necessarily for the rural people, at least in Kerala, where we do some experiments, we found that that's not true. Wherever there is a, a, a there is a smartphone available, and if a student has got the interest and in, to learn, he has the access to such a large context per se. And quite a bit of interesting product and services are currently being developed by these sort of group of people who work in unison from different part of the world. So there's a different world of uh, of culture which is happening. So these three large changes which is happening into the outside world has its ramifications in the space which we operate. And that is the context in which we need to actually look at how the changes are being visible. So this actually lead to two type of impact. One is something which is very visible. Uh, Thanks to COVID, technology become extremely visible for us into the into the learning space. But it's not the COVID. Even before that, 
the advent of MOOC in Indian context, perhaps YM or uh, NBTEL, uh, was there even before that, may not be adopted to the extent what COVID has helped us to adopt, but you, but there are Coursera's and Udemy's of the world which is available. But we are also seeing that the data is actually getting used quite a bit extensively. In a, in a small format, you are able to understand the learning path of a student because you are monitoring the student very, very closely. In a larger format, that is not possible, but the data comes from that, which actually help you onto that. In fact, if as some of you work in OB sort of a models knows that when you are looking at the, the assurance of learning, we are not really looking at the marks the students score, but we primarily look at the, 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 the embedded elements in the rubrics, which ensures whether the learning objectives have been met or not. Those of you who are not familiar with it, I'm sure that in the in the days to come, this will be discussed in much more detail. So there is a there is a very key element of database decision making happening in this. There is a quite a bit of uh, disruption of the traditional jobs and ways of working happening, uh, which is also which is evident to us. And the power of peers, uh, rather than uh, the learning space, is actually moved from teacher to student to student to student. It's a very simple question that if a student has got a doubt, I'm speaking about a reasonably enlightened student, a student has got a doubt, in the past the student should have asked you as a teacher or go to a library. Today, they may post that in a quorum because you know that some peer from some part of the world will answer that. And the quality of discussions which is happening in some of these forums are actually pretty, pretty great. So you see that there is a, there is a power of peers which is happening. Whether we like it or not, the learning has actually become much more spiritual because it's not limited only to the teacher learner process, but even beyond that per se. I'm sure that there are many people who are sitting here has got a very different view on this and uh, may have may not agree with all of this. I'm very happy to take questions or comments or difference of opinions on that. At the end, there is there's nothing called absolute truth. This is all perceptions and models which we think about. But what I would like to put more fo forcefully to you is that not so visible, but what is really uh, important for us is that there is an emergence of small which is happening. From a large format, things are happening at a very, very small format. Right from a simple thing like the light in your room must have happened in, in maybe two years or three years back, it must have, the electricity must have come from a centralized grid or a, a, a thermal power plant miles away. Today, it must be coming from your own rooftop. So you are seeing that in technology space, decentralization happened. In a in a in a customized space, in a procurement space, it is happening. You know, you go to uh, Amazon, you want to buy a product, you get a very customized type of a services over there. So whatever is visible for us, we see customized thing. This is exactly the same thing happening into the into the context of uh, education also. We actually move from the large to personalized, mass to specific sort of a move, and and the locus of control, which as teachers and institutions we have such a great pride that our students, with various external elements coming in, the type of changes which any in any uh, proposes, including um, student centricity, the flexibility of learning, the the academic bank of credit that locus of control is shifting. You are actually moving from one to another where you suddenly see that the student is actually a student of multiple institutions. They collect from here, there, multiple places and create a, a whole. Now, this reduction is some model which has been proposed where an education which was assumed to be a whole in the past is now for flexibility split into part actually necessitate that there should be some common standard of learning which is to be kept. And common standard of learning, what we understood, when I say we, I'm not speaking about all of us, but most of us understood in the past was on the outputs. From that, we are saying that I will have a process in which my course aligns with this particular vision, give this outcome. Someone else's course with, will provide that outcome. So these learning outcomes are designed and fixed and I have a process which ensures that outcome. Merging this is not going to be a very difficult thing because you already know about it. 
this is the key essence in which the OBE have to be thought uh, uh, in total. And you also have uh, uh, the, the new skills for survival, which includes ability to learn, adapt, and excel. If you have looked at the, my earlier, the, the quantitative graph, which I have shown you, you must have seen that the technology cycles are shrinking. So you have a very short shrinking cycles over the period. You know, textile cycle was for around 180 years. Automobile cycle was for around 100 years. Computer cycle was around 50 years. When it comes to newer cycles, the cycle time is very short. When it becomes short, you cannot teach students what they can, what they need to uh, study. You can only make them learn because by the time they come out of the colleges, many of the things which they adopt, technologies they adopt, tools they adopt are become uh, obsolete. So you need to create a learning ability to the student. That's what Professor Gurukal mentioned that they start saying that there is a clear uh, need, understanding, and a more so today that there is a need to shift from a teacher-centric model to a student-centric model per se. And you also move from this output to outcomes per se. <clears throat> so into Excel in this world of disruption, which is happening around us, we actually need to make a change in the education institutions where rather than being a follower in the trends, we may actually have to lead per se. This is more so in the context of India, where Honorable Prime Minister has given us a 30 trillion dream for the next 25 years or 5 trillion dream in the next three years, where we need to almost double our economy, which means it cannot be a factory driven economy anymore. It has to be driven through innovations. It has to be driven through newer entrepreneurship, which again leads to a point that is the student has got the right attributes to do that. Do their attributes match them beyond the cognitive ability to apply their knowledge? Do they have that? Is this the question which we need to look at? So from a factory driven stage, we may actually have to transit to a, what we call as an innovation driven stage per se. And all these things are primarily the essence in the national education policy. If you look at national education policy, some of the key tenets of it are, for the first time we are speaking about student autonomy. We used to speak about institutional autonomy. We used to speak about teacher autonomy, but we never used to speak about student autonomy. Here we are speaking about a student autonomy where the student has got the freedom to choose. But as I said, when student chooses, you will have to ensure that the, the items he chooses all meet common standards. That framework is important for us to do that. So there's a shifting of priorities. A shifting of priorities extend from research skills, self-learning skills, self-engagement skills, better decision-making skills, etc. So, uh, Dr. Uh, Malikit, you have a question? You were saying something? Your mic is not muted. You are audible. Please go ahead. Okay. Right. Maybe by mistake. No, it's not muted. Continue. Are you asking something? Dr. No, Malik? I said your mic is not muted. You proceed. There's no issue with the audio. No, no. In fact, uh, Dr. Malkit actually raised the hand. That's why I asked ah, whether okay, okay, okay. any question because I thought. Okay. The third element is it provides you amount of flexibility and autonomy per se. So this critical changes which provides flexibility and standardization, changing the role of education institutions, and use institutions to drive the excellence. These elements are the ones which drive our new education. Because we know that when we speak about OBE, we start with the vision. And many times, not always, many times the visioning is done in a very mechanical fashion. It was never looked at that this vision aligns with the national objectives. This vision aligns with the regional objectives. That's not looked at. It, it has to look at from that angle and then it drives 
how to program <laughs> digital objectives, to program objectives, to course learning objectives, <laughs> which the student is going to achieve. This alignment is many times more or less missing. And uh, as mentioned earlier in, in the uh, speeches, it's, it's become very, very mechanistic process. So moving from a mechanistic process to holistic innate process is something which we need to be aware and we need to internalize it. The real champions of OBE are the people who align it and internalize it. And once you internalize it, it becomes a very interesting and a very effective process. And the time has come that we have to do that because as our PM keep on telling us that it's time that India to lead. We cannot ignore this. We cannot just be a follower. We need to be the leader. If you really wanted to transform India into an inclusive, vibrant knowledge society, we actually need to create well-rounded, thoughtful individuals. We need to create a strong base for knowledge creation and innovation. And we need to create world-class institutions. So all this is possible only if the processes in the organizations align with that. And that is something which needs to be uh, the new normal in education, where there are three key shifts happening. And I again wanted to stress this because I'm almost sure that in, in the days to come, when you will be taken through the mechanistic uh, aspects of OBE, which at the end, you need to know how this is getting implemented in our uh, colleges and our courses and our curricula. We need to actually know the nuts and bolts of it. Keep this larger picture also in the mind that this sort of a shift is actually happening where there is an autonomy of the learner which happens. There is an emergence of self which is happening. So if some colleges, some teachers used to say that our students don't have the maturity to do that, it primarily means that we have not created that capability in them. We have Our outcomes are failed. That is the meaning of it. They are not able to really create that a, a, a higher student, a, 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 a higher learning student is not able to do that. There is, there is a limit to that. And second is, of course, we need to move into a leadership role, which is also an important element uh, for us. And then you need to uh, look at how do we, the third element is obviously that's not, into the into the OBE model, but primarily we need to integrate skills and knowledge per se. So this all lead to new uh, normal in education, both at the global and national level. There is an enhancing learnability, which 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 is which is the key thing which is going to succeed if. India is going to waste its democratic dividend. We cannot blame those people who have that. We need to actually blame the place where they invested. So if, 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 uh, uh, and that place they invest is in our institutions. And our institutions are the ones which have to ensure that the demographic dividend is actually uh, uh, given into a large level per se. And they, and we also move to our self-paced learning. And this holistic learning and new traits of leadership, which the World Economic Forum speaks about. Yeah, I'll just come that to question, uh, Mr. Govind, on just a second. Uh, complex problems, so all these skills, social skills, system skills, etc. These skills, if you need to impart, you really require a, a slightly different model per se. So let me uh, just stop this presentation and take the questions uh, because I think there's some more questions. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, NAP focuses on more on changing the role of education institutions in imparting OB, but one measure to evaluate OB's placement. No policy change are imposed on the industry. Okay. <laughs> Good question. Uh, uh, why do you say that there is a uh, there is there need to be a policy change on the industry? Uh, 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 what does it mean that uh, you need to have policy changes imposed on the industry? Uh, uh, is, is it possible uh, um, uh, to go into explain that? I didn't understand that uh, question. Why? Why? Yeah. Uh, can you unmute, uh, uh, Professor Govind? Sigin? Uh, can you hear me? 
yeah 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 we can hear this is govind yeah. huh. Uh, why? Because even if we focus more on uh, interdisciplinary education, you know, you know where we are supposed to uh, include courses on liberal arts and many other things. So that's that that's a major major change in the education what we are started in current curriculum as per NEP. But industries as when industries come to our college for the recruitment, they still rely on the basics related to our uh, stream only. I belongs to electronics. So what we are facing is because to include these courses in our curriculum, we are not uh, finding a room to put our core courses. So we have to compromise with our core courses. We are facing a lot of problems. Where is the slot to put a core courses that industry is expecting, especially with the placements? So only option left with us cut short our core courses and put these courses. Okay, <laughs> good question. In fact, uh, there are two aspects to this. Uh, if you look at uh, along with the interdisciplinary courses other things there is also a blended learning which has come right so which primarily means that uh, the education model of delivery has to make a, a transition so if you look at you just now spoke about the time you don't have the time to introduce a, a core course now or some other your, your curricular courses why it should be taught that's the question we need to ask, right? Why we need to be fully taught? Why can't actually we make a part of that to be learned by the student? And that's precisely what uh, blended learning speaks about, right? And UGC allows today between 30 to 70% blended learning in every course. So you cannot actually implement newer things with an older, uh, uh, what you call frameworks. You really require a different frameworks for that. So if only if you have that frameworks, you will have this uh, change as such. So in fact, uh, uh, you spoke about this industry. I was actually talking to the founder of uh, Soho. You, you may be knowing that Soho is one of the very, very successful company from India, uh, perhaps one of the globally leading company. And so Sridhar Venbu was speaking about a college in Tamil Nadu, which actually made a complete transition, a complete transition where their classes are actually limited to two days or even lesser than that, where the teachers actually make videos and the students learn. And the remaining thing, the students are into the, into the, uh, into the laboratories, doing themselves, identifying the, the type of problems they can solve within the college, outside the college, globally. Now, he says that Soho today recruits maximum students from that college because they find that they are industry ready from day one because they are people who have created the ability to learn rather than write and pass the examinations. Now, this is one example. So there are many industries who are actually shifting to that. Not all, but many shifting to that. So the answer to this is that you ask industry how many of them are really happy with the type of products which is going from our colleges. Most of them say they are not. Even But for, for the want of, they want people, they are taking it. So it is a, it's a, it's, this transition is something which we need to actually start looking at it. And as I said, just like industry struggled in 1990s when things changed, that is the challenge we all face at this point. So the one advantage is that if OBE framework is applied in full thing, we need to actually start uh, make it as an important element as such. Now, again, don't keep... OB as something where you need to only for an evaluation purpose, right? If you, if you do this as a mechanistic manner, you may not get the type of returns which it should give. And in fact, if you look at last 30 years, it has not given the type of return also. Uh, the question you need to ask, okay, good question, uh, 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 Mr. Abu Bakar, that there is a lack. There's a lack of employability which you spoke about uh, uh, with OB. Now, I always have a, have a doubt here. You go around the country, most of the states, most of the companies who come to recruit us, all of them say that our students are not employable, right? And they always, and you have hundreds of surveys being done by aspiring minds to um, NASCOM to, and they come out with, beautiful figures that 20% of the students are employable, 30% of students are employable and things like that. But let me ask you a question. If these students are not employable, how come 
at least 20 to 30 percent of world fortune 100 companies are headed by indians who studied from indian universities and indian colleges how come the the indian space research organization has got 99 percent indians and become the best space body in the world how come the people who pass out of our own arts and science colleges actually make india extremely proud by developing very very advanced atomic uh, 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 inventions uh, defense equipment and and right from world's cheapest car, the lowest cost car, to the lowest cost uh, Mars mission. They all came from our own colleges, right? They all came from our own education system. How come many of the world economic bodies, maybe World Bank, maybe IMF, these are all have people from India come out from our own colleges, our own universities, heading or at leadership position. If they are not employable, how do they reach there? So, there is some some counter logic to this this whole argument of employability the the solution the the reason is simple in the past and generally institutions and colleges used to provide knowledge we provide knowledge our our capabilities our curriculum was primarily to impart knowledge which provide them lifelong learning lifelong survival Nothing. but they are they don't make them employable on day one they, we, we, most of our topics which we teach, the things which we cover in our syllabus, they make them help in the long run, but not necessarily on day one. It was okay because the people who recruit them used to train them for day one skills. But that is changed. Because technologies are fast changing, you need to ensure that they become day one employable. At the same time, they should have long term perspectives and learn also. So, Institutions, academics today has a huge challenge. They need to incorporate both skills and knowledge together. And that is why OBE also looks at placement. That is the one which, which we need to understand. Why OBE looks at placement is that it looks at immediate outcome, which is a placement. But at the same time, you also should have a long term learning. Otherwise, you have some skill guys coming in, teaching them one particular programming language. They write that, get into a company, that is not placement. That's that's only immediate placement. It will not help them the long-term placement. Combining these two is something which is required. And that is what today's uh, education processes have to. And what OB tried to achieve is that it provides you a, a layer where you plug into this, your processes will be plugged into this so that this can actually be achieved. You need to actually look at from that perspective. And that perspective is help you to understand in a, a slightly different manner per se. I don't know whether I uh, 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 made, uh, I mean, whether I answered your question. So any other questions? Uh, I that one question which says, um, could you suggest some materials to study OB at its basic level? Yeah, I think that's that's uh, that. I mean, we, I can share that, but I'm sure that uh, you will be actually providing that, right? Cool. Yes, they will be getting access to our LMS as well. So yeah. there are some there are materials in that, so they can study the OB at the uh, basic level from that. There are also experiences from the previous um, sessions as well, so they can see resources from that. <clears throat> Let me just uh, quickly uh, have a couple of more minutes. And uh, in other words, this point which now Mr. Abubakar asks. So we need to ask this question Should our graduates have got day one skills? And what are these day one skills? Day one skills includes technical know how, which means which our field you know you are you, you you teach them a history are they do they have a capability to record uh, uh, assess uh, the historical value of uh, of an artifact to specific skills required for each of them to conceptualizing design solutions interpersonal communication collaborations management lifelong learning ethics diversity adapt to changing environment etc now if you look at many times we see that 
we miss many of these things in our totality. So this the technical know-how and perhaps conceptualizing and designing solutions is what our output, which means the examinations measure. Our examination doesn't measure other things. In fact, it, it is antithesis to collaboration, right? We don't allow students to collaborate. We Even if we say there are projects where we allow them to collaborate, but more often than not, we find that we don't, we actually go for individual evaluations. It, it, we, we don't allow them to collaborate in the, into the true sense of it. So we see that in general, we don't do that. We Our output measure only the first two. Many other things which is completely missing in our measurement metrics. And that is something which makes this outcomes very, very relevant for them. So if you really wanted to create individual still high order learning and mastery rather than accumulation of course credits, because as we discussed earlier, course credit generally checks the first two, not always. And earlier on, uh, professor was asking this question that the NEP speaks about a lot of interdisciplinary courses and soft courses, etc. Why are we speaking about the soft courses is because of this reason. Because if you really wanted to make a person who is outcome oriented, you really require the along with the other two, this is also required. But then if we don't measure as a whole, then you will have a problem because you you are your technical skills are not there. When I say technical skills, I'm not speaking about engineering. I'm speaking about whichever be the field you are. Your technical skills are not there, but you know how to speak well. You have only soft skills, which is what many times we speak about. No, we can have a life skill for the student. It may they may get a job in day one, but they will never ever progress. They will end up there. It's important that the entire whole has to happen, and a true implementation of OBE will measure that. And you really need that process for providing and measuring such skills. And that's basically where the typical OBE uh, methodologies, I'm sure that will be discussed in more details in the days to come. So I just took from NBA's model of uh, thing, which primarily look at what a student should be able to do. You define that, you see how to make the student achieve that outcome, which is basically your curriculum design happening. And how do you measure is basically where learning and teaching coming and you need the assessment part of it. So from an outcome which starts with the mission to the the uh, the the pro program education objectives to program objectives to the course objectives, look at the type of assessment mechanisms and continuously improve this to the process. Why do you require all these things? Because the future skills in the past we were actually looking at providing cognitive abilities. We may give sometimes physical abilities also. Maybe that is now much less. We don't have much of physical uh, abilities being provided in higher education. We provide more cognitive abilities and maybe basic skills. But the newer world requires complex problem solving skills. And complex problem solving skills requires analysis of complex aspects. You know, looking at a problem in a much, much larger context per se. They really require social skills, they require uh, process skills, which to some extent maybe we may be providing in our existing curricula, output-based curricula. And you also require system skills, which looks at the longer implications of that. So if you wanted to do that, you need to actually integrate all these things. And the Harvard says, I mean, it's in a different way of looking at an OBE model, is that, the real process of education happens when you combine all the three, knowing, doing, and being. The understanding, implementation, and people be a part of it. Multiple methodologies where the learning becomes a very, very enjoyable process. So let me stop here by saying that I did not go into the nuances of how OBE get implemented because that is not the objective which I thought I will speak today because you will have a, uh, a, a sessions where you will be built from the very basic foundations. Uh, the those Mendes and team has, is doing this for several years. They have great expertise in building it right from start to develop the entire OBE framework in your institutions. But while you do that, 
it is also important for us to look from a larger uh, canvas where this actually uh, fits in. Because if you adopt something as a philosophy and you adopt something as a tool, there's a big difference. I end by a story and there I stop. Uh, all of us know about Japan, right? And when we think about Japan, we think about quality, whether it is Sony or whether it is uh, Japanese products. We always think about Japanese products of, of great quality. But many of you may be knowing, or if you don't know, you can ask your grandfather. In 60s and 50s, which was the country which makes the worst products in the world? And your answer will be Japan. Because from extremely poor quality products, Japan actually trans into products which are of world-class quality, whether it is Toyota, whether it is uh, Sony, whether it is... So this transition has happened because they adopted a quality framework. We not discuss the quality framework, but I just wanted to speak about that one aspect of it. It's actually done by an American statistician called Deming. So he gave Japanese uh, some 14 principles, just like our OBE principles. He gave 14 principles how to actually create a systemic change in the quality. And Japanese understood this, like a lecture like this, maybe in a session, he did this. And when they were about to leave, he called them and asked, said, well, there is one more principle, the 15th principle. The 15th principle is that either you take all 14 principles or don't take any. You cannot make this or that. If you really wanted to implement, the entire thing has to be implemented in total. So this is true with OBE. If OBE has to be implemented in true spirit and you really require a transformational change in your organizations, rather than just getting a NAC accreditation or NBA accreditation or uh, some brownie points in some of the accreditations, if you really wanted to make a transformation change, which I strongly believe is today, there's no choice because you will not exist if you don't do that. It is important that every bit of OBE has to be taken and assemble it and put it together. You can, it, it's like a beautiful picture. If some portion of a beautiful picture is not there, the picture is not complete, it becomes an ugly thing. It happens only when every element fits in together. And I'm sure that in the days to come, you will be taken through all the elements don't pick and choose the elements. Take all the elements as Toto, put them together, and let us have OB implemented in its true spirit to make the transformation in our organizations. Wish you all the very best, and thank you very much for a very, very patient listen. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sajid Gopinath. Thank you for that informative session. If any of you have any questions, you can immediately unmute and ask uh, Dr. Sajid. Or you can just post the questions in the chat box and we'll pick it up. Yes, Jimon. Somebody has raised a hand. Okay, I think uh, uh, there are no questions. So thank you very much, and uh, wish you a great evening, and uh, hope I mean wish you a very great uh, learning session uh, in the days to come. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Sanjeev Now we will move on to uh, the overview of the FTP and detail. Now we will have the overview of the FTP and details of the mode of delivery. This will be delivered by Dr. Mendes Jacob. Dr. Mendes Jacob is an academician and entrepreneur with 30 plus years of experience and is a former director of School of Applicable Mathematics in MG University. Sorry. He is also the CEO of IPSR Solutions Limited, an IT company supporting higher education institutions in the implementation of outcome-based education and innovative teaching, learning and assessment strategies. Audio, sir. Yes, Jin. Most respected 
Dr. Rajan Kurikal, um, the chairman, vice chairman of uh, Kerala State Higher Education Council. Uh, Dr. Saji Gopinath, the vice chancellor of Digital University. Dr. Rajan Burgis, the member secretary of KSHEZ. Dr. Dominic, the principal of PCS College. Dr. Sajish, the IQC coordinator. Dr. Thanya is the coordinator of uh, this program. Dr. Priya Nair from uh, KSHEZ. Is also the coordinator of uh, this faculty development program. Principals, professors, and uh, distinguished uh, delegates from uh, different parts of India. I, good evening to all. Uh, actually, we had a thought provoking session by Dr. Sajid Gopinath. As always, uh, it was an insightful session and uh, eye opening for uh, many of the faculty members. Thank you, sir, for your presence and uh, in spite of your busy schedule, you have delivered a very good informative session. Thank you very much. Uh, about this uh, faculty development program, we have more than 1,300 registrations. And uh, some of you are online now. Uh, there is a YouTube live running parallel, and many of the participants, they are attending that. And again, we have a learning management system where uh, all the recorded sessions are host, uh, will be hosted there in the LMS so that uh, even if you miss some of the live sessions, uh, uh, you can get it from that uh, learning management system and also from the YouTube. And this particular FDP, uh, we have designed in a unique way where uh, we have a learning management system. Uh, and this is an example of how the virtual training can be done with an OB approach. We have explored most of the uh, facilities or most of the features of a model like a workshop uh, is there. From the workshop activity, you can have the peer evaluation and a lot of learning is happening there instead of teaching. Uh, that is the paradigm shift in OB as everybody knows. There should be a paradigm shift from the teaching to learning. And we have the lesson activity where uh, the assurance of learning concept uh, is introduced. That is also there in the LMS. And we have uh, uh, other uh, online tools like uh, Padlet we are using, and that is for the collaborative learning. And uh, we have a lot of uh, content, uh, like reference materials, videos, and a lot of content is again posted in the LMS. So you can just go through this learning management system and you will get access to the LMS um, maybe one more week after the completion of this uh, program on 25th so that uh, you can have your activities like your task and assignments completed uh, maybe uh, in two weeks even after the the completion of the fdp you can just go through the task and assignments and you have to complete all these tasks and assignments to get a certificate again uh, uh, i will just give an idea about uh, the program schedule, how this is designed. Uh, today we have the, uh, the inaugural section, and tomorrow we have a section on a Bloom's taxonomy, the learning domains by Dr. Sunil Job. He's a PhD in education and a former principal having more than 30 years of experience. Then we'll have the introduction to OB and formulation of outcomes. Then assessment design and mapping of outcomes. Many of the faculty members, they have doubts in how to map the, uh, the course outcomes to POs and PSOs. All these things will be handled uh, in two days. Uh, then uh, there is a section from the industry person like Dr. Suresh Nambudri. He's the former chief operating officer of Tata Motors. Uh, there's a section on uh, OB, the underlying trends. That's an industry perspective. Can you just uh, mute, mute your video? Okay. Uh, then uh, on Monday, we have a section on calculation of attainment in OB, uh, how to calculate uh, the attainment levels. And uh, there are a lot of analytical reports available for uh, uh, mainly for accreditation purpose. You can use these analytical reports like a slow learners, uh, moderate learners, or advanced learners. You can identify using these uh, analytics reports. Uh, then assurance of learning concept that can be implemented the institution while uh, with these reports. Then teaching to learning a paradigm shift. You'll have some case studies how to 
how uh, you know, like uh, innovative teaching, learning, and uh, evaluation methods, you will get uh, some examples of uh, uh, innovative learning, um, teaching, learning, and uh, assessments. Then we have uh, immersive technologies for OB implementation and case studies again by Dr. Jobi Sriak and Dr. Pinu Thomas from Marian College Kutikana. So this is the uh, the uh, schedule of the seven day program. Then we have a uh, uh, we have uh, uh, the LMS. I will just show you the LMS also so that. Uh, just you will have an idea what all things you can do there. Uh, this is the learning management system where uh, um, device sections are uploaded there. Uh, you will get the recorded videos. Then every day you will have uh, some tasks and assignments. You can complete it uh, according to your own time because you know, even if you complete uh, Today's task tomorrow, there is no problem because this LMS access will be extended for one more week. So that you can finish it according to your pace and time. So all these activities are there and some of the parlets, it's already embedded so that uh, uh, you can use this for the collaborative learning. Like uh, there are some course outcomes already uploaded by some of the faculty members who have attended our uh, faculty development program in a uh, uh, previous months or years and you can just go through these course outcomes and you can comment on them uh, and you can also post your course outcomes or uh, your uh, the questions uh, you can frame quality questions based on bloom's taxonomy and you can post it on the part out uh, on this partlet then um, one more thing uh, uh, before uh, winding up just i want to know how many uh, what is your proficiency uh, in OB uh, about this group. So I will share a, a Mentimeter link so that you can just give your responses there. This will be helpful for us to uh, deliver the topics. We have shared a link in the chat box. Uh, you can just go to that link and uh, uh, you can give your responses there. Otherwise, you can <clears throat> go to menti.com. Then go to menti.com. And you can have this code. You'll be asked a code. You can type that code one seven two seven nine six three two. That is on the top of the screen. <clears throat> you can go to that link in the chat box. You can give your response there. Otherwise, you can go to mendy.com. You can go to mendy.com. Then you can type this code one seven two seven nine six three two. I will repeat once more. You can go to menti.com, M-E-N-T-I, menti.com, and you can type a code. You will be asked a code there. You can type the code one seven two seven nine six three two. Please give your responses. So this will be useful for the resource persons. If you are new to OB, please give your response accordingly. Then aware of OB. That good knowledge in OB and expert in OB. You have 30 seconds more to respond. Either you can go to that link in the chat box and you can give that your response there. Otherwise, you can go to menti.com, M-E-N-T-I.com. 
and type the code I'm extending the time because I'm getting some more responses. Please give your response. Thirty seconds more. You can give your response. Yeah, this is the response. Like we have equal number of uh, professors with uh, who are new to OB and aware of OB. So this is the trend. Okay. Thank you for your response. I will give you one more poll because we have participants from almost all the states of India. Now you can <clears throat> give the name of your state, which state uh, you belong to. Again, the same method, you can use uh, that link already there in the chat box, or you can go to mendy.com. You can go to mendy.com and you can use the same code 17279632. You can type the name of uh, your state there, which state you belong to. So we have received the response from around 200 faculty members. Others also please give your response. We start the countdown, 30 seconds more. You can go to menti.com and you can type the code one seven two seven nine six three two. So it's interesting to see people from uh, a different state, like uh, even from Meghalaya, Assam. Many distant places, Punjab, West Bengal. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. So from tomorrow onwards, we will start uh, the uh, the technical sessions. Then, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we have a. Uh, the learning manual system where you'll get the, all the uploaded videos, the recordings of the videos. Even if you are not able to attend any particular live session, uh, you'll get the videos there. And the content and everything uh, there in the 
uh, LMS. So if you have any other questions or any queries regarding the LMS or uh, anything else, okay, how do we get the access to LMS? Uh, for getting access to LMS and certificate, there is a nominal fee. You have to pay that uh, nominal fee for the certificate processing and uh, access to LMS. The, all the online sessions are free. And if you have any uh, any queries regarding that, uh, you know, um, you can call the numbers. It's already provided there in the chat box, or uh, you can WhatsApp. That's a WhatsApp number. You can give a message, so you will be contacted back. And the account number of the college is already given in the chat box, so that if you want LMS access, you can pay the amount, and uh, you will get the access. And if you have already paid and uh, haven't received the LMS access, please contact uh, the numbers. And there is no particular assignment for today. Uh, tomorrow onwards, we will have uh, the, the technical sessions and we will have the uh, task and assignments. Okay. You can contact the respective persons. The numbers are already there in the chat box. Yeah. So thank you very much for joining from uh, the different places. We have more than 600 institutions, faculty members from 600 uh, institutions, and hope and wish that uh, these sessions will be uh, useful for you. And thank you very much, and good night. Thank you, Mr. Sir. Thank you for that wonderful session. Um, giving an information of the FTP and also the details of LMS. Uh, now we will have the word of thanks. That will be by Dr. Sajis TJ, Assistant Professor and HOD, Department of Commerce, IQAC Coordinator. He's a PhD from Kandu University in Finance. He's got 11 years of teaching experience. Over to you, Dr. Sajis. Good evening to all. This is the function. Dr. Rajendurukal, the Vice Chairman of Kerala State Higher Education Council, Chairman of the function, Dr. Rajiv Varghese, Member Secretary of Kerala State Higher Education Council, Keynote Speaker, Dr. Saji Govinath, the Vice Chancellor of Digital University of Kerala, Manager of SES College, Mr. Vinil Varghese, Principal of SES College, Dr. Dominic Thomas, Introductory Speaker, Dr. Mendel Jacob, our resource persons, Dr. Sunil Jobke, Dr. Suresh Nambudri, Dr. Vinu Thomas, Dr. Jobi Suryak, Program Coordinators Priya Nair, Dr. Danya Yesi, all other dignitaries, faculties from various colleges in India. I feel honored and privileged to get the opportunity to propose a vote of thanks on this special occasion. First of all, I extend my most sincere thanks to the Almighty God for making this event happen. I would like to thank Kerala State Higher Education Council and Marian College Gutikanam for giving us an opportunity to collaborate with you to organize this seven days faculty development program. On behalf of SS College Riyandavaram and Kerala Higher Education Council, I extend hearty word of thanks to Dr. Rajan Gurukal the Vice Chairman of Kerala State Higher Education Council, who spared the time from his busiest schedule to grace the occasion and inaugurate the session with his words. Sir, remind us to be professionally dedicated to implement the OBE. Thank you, sir, for your enlightened words. I extend my thanks to Dr. Rajan Varghese, the Member Secretary of Kerala State Higher Education Council, who presided the function and he enlightened our minds by his words. He reminding us about the skill and will to bring the changes. Thank you, sir. I would like to express my sincere thanks to the keynote speaker, Dr. Saji Gobinath, the Vice Chancellor of Digital University of Kerala. With your great words, we got inspired and motivated to learn and how to implement OB. Thank you, sir, for reminding us about the learner-centric education. Thank you, sir. I extend my sincere thanks to Mr. Vinil Varghese, the manager of SES College Riyandavaram, for the wholehearted support and wishes. I express my sincere thanks to Dr. Dominic Thomas, the principal of SES College Riyandavaram, 
for his enthusiastic leadership and support to us. I am very thankful to Dr. Mendes Jacob, Professor Marian College Guttikaram. He is the one who supported and guided us to organize the program in collaboration with Kerala State Higher Education Council. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. I am thankful to Dr. Sunil Jokke, my teacher and well-known speaker in outcome-based education. Thank you, sir, for being our resource person for this program. I express my gratitude towards Dr. Suresh Nambudri, the product development specialist, Dr. Binu Thomas, IQAC coordinator and associate professor of Marian College, Guttikanam, Dr. Joby Siriak, IQAC coordinator and associate professor of Marian College, Guttikanam, being the resource persons of this seven days FDP. I express my sincere gratitude towards all the dignitaries, all the principals, and all the faculties from various colleges in India. I express my sincere thanks to the program coordinators Priya Naya, Research Officer of Kerala State Higher Education Council, Dr. Danya Yesi, Assistant Professor of SAS College Sri and Abhinam, and all the IQAC team members and all the faculties of SAS College and non-teaching staff of SAS College for the supports and hard work for this program. I would like to thank the technical team behind this program. Their effort, their immense uh, dedication for this program was the success, success of this program. Thank you, thank you very much. Last but not least, I would like to thank all the honorable delegates who blessed us with your presence. I hope this seven days program will through light on outcome-based education and evaluation of the program outcome by adopting the Bloom's taxonomy. I wish you all the very best. Thank you. Have a nice day. Good night. Thank you, Dr. Sajish TJ. Uh, thank you for that word of thanks. Uh, I am seeing a few questions on how to get access to the LMS. To get the LMS, you need to pay the processing fee of rupees 300 to receive the, receive, uh, the uh, access to the LMS as well as to get the participation certificate. Uh, you can make the payment to the account details that was given in the uh, chat box. Uh, and if you have already made the payment and uh, you have not received an email on this, please check with the uh, support uh, team uh, numbers that have been given there. Uh, you will have to you know, just call them up and check that um, you have already received the mail. If not, um, just check with them and the LMS access will be provided. Thank you all. Thank you again. For, thank you for uh, attending this session. Uh, we will see you again tomorrow, same time, uh, 7 p.m. We will have tomorrow session at 7 p.m. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you and good night.